Our next speaker is Professor Hanin Duhani Menachem, who is a professor of law in the Faculty of Law at Hebrew University. And he's the author of several books and many articles. His focus lately is on philosophy of law and Jewish law from a jurisprudential point of view. Thank you very much. I was wondering whether you are going to mention Maimonides. I promise that I will not mention Maimonides even once in my presentation. <laughs> and it is a conceptual analysis that I'm going to offer here in response to what Benny has offered here. The question is, on what basis can we say that a given legal system is a religious legal system? That was a topic of the paper that Benny mentioned I wrote a few years ago. The claim that Jewish law, Talmudic law, is a religious legal system has been put forward by traditional scholars as well as by scholars in the academia very often. And I was, I, I wanted to ask myself, why, on what basis and in what sense is Talmudic law a religious legal system? And so I uh, wrote this paper and uh, Benny, in his presentation here, gives few other examples on what basis can we say that Talmudic law is a religious legal system? He adds some further parameters by which we can determine whether Talmudic law and, if we extrapolate, other legal systems can be uh, said to be religious. <coughs> now, what he is saying, Benny, Benny argues that new theologies, new ideas about the divine and the workings <coughs> of the divine may give rise to new legal instruments new mechanism for administering the law. This new mechanism may in turn give rise to new criteria for determining whether a legal system is a religious legal system. Now, in principle, I fully concur with this idea. And in fact, that was the gist of the paper Poat commented on. A theological shift during the Talmudic period brought about a shift in the administration of the law, rendering it on the whole more rational. And as I said, Porat Benny suggests few more examples, and I will turn to these examples shortly. But I prepared my comment on the basis of the written version uh, Benny gave me, and so now, in order to express myself, I will have to read some of his written version, which he did not include in his presentation, in order to explain where do I argue with him where I am not accepting his position. Now, Benny implies, however, that while my, my analysis and this paper may have captured the criteria <coughs> relevant to determining the religiosity of Talmudic legal system, my analysis may no longer be apt for assessing the religiosity of contemporary legal systems due to theological changes that may have underwent. And if I quote him now, he says, therefore, when we come to examine the religious nature of a legal system at a certain period of time, we must do according to theological, the theology relevant to that period. There is no point examining the nature of a legal system in a certain period if that theology is no longer relevant. So what I would like first to do is to say something about the importance of looking at early theology, even if it is no longer valued or endorsed. One basic point that emerged from my paper is that, practically speaking, there are no legal systems we are aware of that have no religious elements, even if the system we are considering are not based on any religious ideology. Now, this observation attests to a very important feature <coughs> of what is known as political theology. In his seminal political theology, four chapters on the concept of sovereignty written in 1922, Carl Schmitt, then a critique of liberalism, and later an unrepentant Nazi, this Schmitt nevertheless became and remained a highly influential political theorist. And he argued in that paper, in that book, that the main concepts of modern political theory were in fact secularized versions of older theological concepts. The enterprise of political theology seeks to discern remnants of religious thinking in the structure of legal systems that have no religious ideology whatsoever. And I want to stress this point because it is often denied, especially by legal thinkers. 
For example, Jerome Frank, an American uh, jurist, writing in 1930, shortly after Schmidt wrote his paper, asserted that, and I quote, the close and avowed relation of law to religion in, ma in a matter of the distant past is a matter of a distant past. The legal profession has long since been split off from the priesthood. To speak of the longing for untenable legal exactness as due to a survival of the bygone domination of law by religion is to be betrayed by word magic. The word survival implies that ancient and obsolete groups' attitudes, although without present meaning, continue inherently to express themselves. And he, of course, and of course, and he of course denies it. Now, in fact, however, the picture is much more complex. And the very opposite of what Frank asserts is actually the case. Religious language has a far greater hold on us than we would like to admit. So when discussing modern legal systems, and even contemporary legal systems, it is therefore important to be aware of religious concepts from the past, so that we can detect the traces of all the religious legal thinking in modern legal systems. So let me put it differently. It is, I believe, prudent to consider contemporary legal system in the light of ancient legal systems and see what traces we can find of the old regime, so to speak, that is the theoretical notions that were pervasive in pre-modern law. So that much about his claim that we should always consider a given legal system according to the prevailing theology. Now, it is very important to consult the old regime, the old theology, in order to understand what is left of that old uh, theology in modern law. <coughs> now, a second basic point that emerged from my, that I, well, I wanted to stress in my paper, and I think somehow maybe I was not clear enough, is that every ideology of course, is likely, is likely to affect the legal system that is put in place to promote it. <coughs> legal systems are in fact tools to advance the ideology of the ruling body. The ruling body uses the legal device to express and to promote its ideology. So, we can expect to find substantive law, substantive legal arrangements, that echoes the prevailing religious and political ideology of the place and time in question. Hence, now I come to Benny, some of the examples Benny cites in his paper are no more than reflections of changes in the prevailing religious ideology. The point made in my paper, however, and I will stress it later on, is that it is much more significant to identify functional legal instruments and techniques that are generated by religious ideology than to identify elements that are simply reflections of that ideology in the substance of the law. So I'm not looking, I think it's much more important, much more significant, if we want to discuss whether a given legal system is a religious legal system, is not to show that there are some substantive ideas in the law that reflect some sort of religion or theology, but rather we have to look at the practice of the law, how the law in its administration differs from a non-religious legal system. And I will come to it in a minute. I'll come back to it in a minute. So that is to say, in my view, it is the practice of the law that we have to look at in order to assess whether and to what extent the system's nature is religious. And of course, we must keep in mind that not every substantive law found in the legal system affects the system's functioning. Now, let me say something about some of the examples Benny cites here, in his case, and they were before on the board. Benny brings the example of the obligation to study the Torah, which he claims was a new legal development in Talmudic era, ensuing from a new theological concept Namely, the idea that study is greater than action, because study leads to action. Now, while I'm not conv so convinced that there is a change here between biblical law and Talmudic law, after all, the Shinantim Levanecha, the Agita Boyoma Valaila, there are so many verses in the Torah, in the Bible, that emphasize the importance of studying the Torah. So I'm not so convinced that there is this, such a revolution, but I would say, it is important to note that even if it is a new obligation, 
that is, it, does, it is not found in the Torah, but it is found in Tanaitic philosophy, it does not impact the system's functioning. And let me explain what I mean by <coughs> We might have expected that given their obligation to study the law, if someone did not know the law and hence committed a transgression, Talmudic law would not deem their ignorance of the law an acceptable legal excuse. Such a policy would, in my mind, indeed be considered a change in the law's functioning. Now, secular legal systems, you all know, such as American law and others, while not upholding an obligation to study the law, do uphold the fiction that everyone is aware of the law. Whereas Talmudic law, by contrast, despite its insistence on the obligation to study the law, does, does not see, that, does see ignorance, does see ignorance of the law as an excuse. This shows to that, to the extent that the obligation to study the law is a new phenomenon, which I have my doubt about, as I said, it did not generate a new mode of practicing the law. Another example cited by, by Benny is the concept of error. Did you speak about error? Very short. Very short. What did you say about error? <laughs> <laughs> what would you say about error? I couldn't say it yet. Yeah. Error yes. is also another example of new development, awareness to the option of error in the law is a new development of the domain. Yeah. You won't find it in Yeah. So in, my, in the written paper which I got, many says that error is a new concept, and, and his analysis in what I got in his written version, well, he focused on tractate horayot. Tractate horayot is a tractate that speaks primarily about error, error in the decision of the court. Now, let us look into this example. Tractate Horayot, which discusses judicial error, is a Tanaitic interpretation of Leviticus chapter 4 and Numbers chapter 15. And the concept of error it develops, the Tanaitic concept that it develops, is heavily influenced by the biblical words, and the thing is hidden, Elam davar. The biblical verse is speaking of error due to ignorance of the law. The doctrine of error in the Talmud is relevant primarily in cases where the error was not aware of a pertinent, of a relevant legal norm. It is not an error in interpreting the law, which is hardly ever discussed in the Talmud. So on this point, the Talmud and Leviticus are in complete harmony, in my view. And as I see no evolution in the Talmudic treatment of the concept of error. Here I should add, of course, that Talmudic law is, of course, much more sophisticated and much more well elaborated than biblical law. However, this sophistication and advanced formulation should not be considered a phenomenon that reflects a change in theology, let alone a change in theology that impacts the operational elements of the legal system. Now, the last example that I want to discuss is Benny's example of the ab initio after the fact. The, the dichotomy, the chatkila and the diavad, which he claimed, uh, which he uh, actually spoke here about. Now, this example raises an important and an interesting question. The explanation Benny offers, the, met, the latter metaphor, the Tanaitic philosophy pr provided a ladder that one can start from the very minimum and go up the ladder, climbing up to the top, and thereby elevating himself to God. That was your explanation for the Chathila Bediavad uh, distinction. Now, the question is, whose account counts? Can we, present-day scholars, Benny, for example, formulate a religious account of a given legal institution and claim on that basis that the system is religious? Or do we, in order to make such a claim, have to find such an account in the sources themselves. My sense is that the religious rationale must be part of the institution itself. However, I think this dichotomy is interesting and could be used in a different way. As Porat knows, a different explanation for that dichotomy has been put forward by Aaron Shemesh in this article that you mentioned. Shemesh argues that the dichotomy is the result of conflicting views among the sages and the sages' desire to rule in accordance with both views. So they say one view is Lechatkhila and the other view is Bidiyavad, so to harmonize and to live peacefully with all views. 
Now this is significant. <coughs> the concern is not the vagueness per se as to the law, the concern of the stages, but rather finding adequate solution for cases where, they, where there is some vagueness. If the stages enterprise is to articulate the divine will, all views regarding a controversial matter must be taken seriously, for we do not know which side got it right. This policy directly reflects a specific perception of our relation to the divine will. Indeed, it gives rise not only to the ab initio after the fact dichotomy, but also to the principle that both are the words of the living God. So it seems to me that the policy of taking all views seriously and not being able to be decisive, not being able to determine which law is we going to accept, to the extent that this is followed, clearly has functional impact on the administration of the law. So I would accept this distinction, this, this, this example, but on a different uh, explanation. But let us go to Benny's proposed solution, the ladder metaphor. Now I want to ask, even if it is for the sake, uh, for the argument's sake, we would, we would find it in the sources themselves, what is its significance? Now, consider a legal institution, such as, for example, the death penalty, that has no religious rationale, deterrence, for example. There's no rationale, religious rationale for the death penalty. <coughs> Now, this very institution can also be accounted for in religious terms, such as the desiderato of sending offenders to purgatory for explication of their sins, Send, sending offenders directly to hell, and then <coughs> they will be punished. The religious justification for the death penalty is based, according to this uh, account, on the belief in the hereafter, in the efficiency of subjecting the offender to divine punishment as a means of purging sins. And there have been many theologians who explained the death penalty on that account. Now, in the Torah, we don't have that account. The Torah does not justify in any way the death penalty on this, in this way. But let us suppose that we are considering a legal system that we have the death penalty there, and this rationale is being offered. Now, my question is, what does it mean? What does it mean? If the rationale does not change judicial practice, what is its significance? How are such examples, of which there are many others, for example, is Shabbat. Shabbat can be explained on a religious ground and can also be explained on a non-religious ground. So why shall we, in order to assert that a legal system is a religious legal system, pay attention to the rhetoric or pay attention to practice, <coughs> practical uh, features of the system? And I would like to conclude by saying, by reminding you of what James Williams said, a difference has to make a difference to be a difference. <laughs>